of your New Testament, Titus. I have uh, been meditating on these verses for a while and want to preach a series over the next few Sunday nights. I'm going to slow down and we're just going to do a methodical study of this word and of this subject and see if we can understand a little bit uh, what it means. Um, tonight will be more of an introduction uh, to the series, but and be a little bit of a doctrinal type message. So I hope you can handle some meat tonight. Amen. Um, stand with me, please, when you find your place in Titus. If you haven't found your place, just stand there and pretend you know where it's at. <laughs> Titus chapter 2. <clears throat> verse number 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. We're gonna begin a series tonight entitled The Godly Life. The Godly Life. We're gonna use this passage is a springboard, but over the next few weeks, we're gonna look at multiple passages of scripture that not only admonish us to live a godly life, but tells us what that means and why it's important and why you and I should strive in, this, in these last days, in this present world, as he said, to live a godly life. Let's pray. Father, we ask you tonight to open our hearts and our minds and our ears, Lord, as we began a study of a very important Bible doctrine, Bible truth, a word that we find often throughout the scriptures. May we as Christians not only understand the command, but Lord, may we understand what it means to live a godly life. And may you be glorified, I pray, through this message, through this series, and through our lives as Christians. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. The word ungodly is found in the King James Bible 24 times. We find the word ungodliness used multiple times. The word godly, the word godliness is used. Those two words are used over 30 times in the scripture. In our text here tonight, we find both the word ungodliness in verse 12 and the word godly. And we so we find this word used a lot. It's both used in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In fact, as I was just looking at some of the verses uh, that deal with this subject, I came across um, a very sad uh, verse in Psalm 12. You don't have to turn there, but in Psalm 12, in verse number one, the Bible says, help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. Then he goes on to say, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. And I know this morning I alluded to the fact that those that decide and choose to serve God and live for God will be in a small minority. And we live in a day and age when, as I said this morning, people live in a pack mentality or a herd mentality. And they're more comfortable if they're with a group, even if the group is wrong. They feel more comfortable around those numbers. And, and when you start dealing with the Christian life and you start dealing with uh, living for God. And we talked about serving God this morning out of Joshua. And in this series, we're gonna be talking about living the godly life. That, that, that group narrows down to a trickle. And you'll just find, every now and then, you'll find a person, an individual, a man, a woman, a young person that really qualifies as a godly person. We have a lot of people that think they're living a godly life. And this is one of the reasons why I felt compelled to not just preach a message, but to preach a series on this subject was because I think we've got a, a mindset that if we do a few godly things, that that makes us a godly person. 
If we make a couple of godly decisions, that makes us a godly person. But godliness is a lifestyle. Okay? Godliness, a godly life, is a life that is characterized by a multiplicity of godly decisions and choices and character traits all strung together that forms a godly life. You can't do one thing godly in the day and consider yourself living a godly life. You can't make a choice between godliness and ungodliness and say, okay, I'm going to choose the godlier of the two and therefore I'm qualified as living the godly life. No, it's a lifestyle that's much, much more involved. And so, um, and it's a learning process. It's a learning process as we're going to see in this passage it's, it's, a learning, it's a learning process over time. God will reveal to you what it means to live a godly life. Here, here's the thing, though. Not too many people are even interested in learning what it means. They're not really interested in identifying as a godly person. They'd much rather fall back into that crowd of people that are either ungodly or a little bit of godliness and ungodliness kind of all mixed together. And they're more comfortable in that, in that area. They're not really striving to live a godly life. And they say, well, maybe I'm not a godly person, but I'm not an ungodly person. And that is the exact group of people that Jesus was talking about in Revelation when he said, you're neither hot nor cold. You're neither hot nor cold. He said, I would spew you out of my mouth. You're lukewarm. In other words, you're average. You're just an average person. You really are not described as an ungodly person. That may be pushing it to say, oh, he's an ungodly man or she's an ungodly person. But then you're really not fitting the bill of a godly person. So you're kind of right in the middle, which is the comfort zone that most people find themselves in. Because when you're in that group of people that are both ungodly and a little bit godly, you can look around and compare. You can compare yourself and say, well, I'm not as bad as, as he is, or I'm not as bad as she is. I'm not as bad as that teenager, or I'm not as bad as, as, as that other person. And so what we do is we, we create a, a false sense of, of spirituality and godliness based on the ungodliness of our peers. Is everybody still with me? In other words, we, we, we catch ourselves either out loud saying it or thinking it, something along these lines, I'm not that bad. Or what I'm doing is not that bad. Not realizing how far below par with God not that bad really is. I'm not that bad of a golfer. I'm not. If you go golfing with me, I may golf 100, 110. Well, that's obviously not great. But I know people that are worse. I know people that hit the ball 50 times on every, on every fairway, okay? And they can't putt and they can't chip and they can't drive. And so compared to them, I'm not that bad. I will par, out of 18 holes, I might par three or four. Get lucky and par three or four. Or, or, or bogey, or double bogey. And I'm, as I'm writing down on my score, plus one, plus two, I'm saying to myself, that was pretty good. Yeah. Well, compared to Tiger Woods, that was horrible. <laughs> but compared to a quadriplegic, I, I was awesome. <laughs> but here's what we do as Christians. We look around and we look at the sin, the wickedness, the ungodliness. We look at the perversion in our society and we say, man, I'm doing pretty good. But are you, are you living a godly life? Do you want to stand before God one day and just look at him in his face and say, I wasn't that bad? Do you want him to look at you and say, thou wert a good and faithful servant or... You didn't really do all that bad. Because we're going to stand before God one day. 
and give an account for the life that we live. Whether it was a godly life or whether it was an ungodly life or whether it was a life of apathy or complacency and where we just didn't really care. As long as we didn't end up in jail, we were okay. You've heard me say that. We've got parents today, their level of expectation for their kids is, has just gotten to the place to where as long as my kid doesn't end up in jail, I'm okay. Wow. Can we raise the bar? Can we raise the bar? Because God in the scripture has raised the bar. So I'm going to look at several different things over the next few weeks. We are together. We're going to look tonight at an introduction. Next week, we're going to look at an indoctrination. Next week, we're going to look at an identification. But let's back up tonight. Let's just look at this part one, an introduction. And there's an introduction to the key to this whole godly living, and that is the grace of God. I'm thankful that I have been blessed by God to have made an acquaintance with his grace. I heard a song one time that says, I'm no stranger to grace. And um, I'm thankful that I know what it's like to be introduced to the grace of God. I'm thankful for the day God bestowed his grace upon me. I'm thankful for the day that I had a head on collision with the grace of God. And that is the catalyst. That's why I'm preaching this whole message on this introduction to grace. Verse number 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. You and I were introduced to the grace of God, which is the catalyst that makes the godly life possible. Amen. We couldn't live the godly life apart from it. You can, lead, you can live a moral life. You, and there's a difference in a moral life and a godly life. There's going to be a lot of moral people in hell. There are going to be a lot of people in hell that lived upright moral lives, obeyed the laws of man, were good to their neighbor, and they were honest and they paid their bills and whatnot, but they never experienced that grace of God that enabled them to take it to another level, which is going beyond just being moral, and that is living a godly life a representation to the world of God. Is everybody still with me? Yes, sir. I'm going to go a little bit slow because I want this to sink in. Three things I want to look at tonight. I want to notice, first of all, a sovereign grace. A sovereign grace. And I get that from the phrase in verse number 11, for the grace of God. Now, let me say this. The phrase sovereign grace has been hijacked by a group of people that we call Calvinists, proponents of uh, John Calvin. Uh, he had some theological issues that contradicted the scripture, but there are a lot of people today that follow the teachings of John Calvin. He had basically five major tenets to his belief. I won't get into those tonight, but you will hear that word sovereign grace used a lot in the Calvinist realm, the Calvinist circles. In fact, I just, I, just for kicks, I Googled sovereign grace and it, it led me to a large number of Calvinist websites with literature and, 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 and churches and, and, and affiliations and whatnot. And it was all, I even if you look at Wikipedia, look up sovereign grace in Wikipedia, you're gonna get a Calvinist theology and an explanation of that. That phrase sovereign grace has been kind of hijacked, but I'm going with that phrase because it tells us in verse number 11, that the grace that we're talking about is the grace of God. It is God's grace. Now you and I have the ability to render grace to people. We can speak grace. We can, we can be graceful. We can be gracious. But we're talking about a sovereign grace, the grace of God. And that is the catalyst. That is what is going to make the godly life possible. The grace of God. Is everybody still with me? I say that a lot because y'all get quiet. And I don't know if you're just trying to figure out what I'm saying. I want to make sure we're all still together. I don't want to go off and leave anybody. I know you can't, you can't talk while you're chewing. I get that. But the grace of God that I find in the Bible has appeared to all men. Is that what your Bible says? One of the tenets of sovereign grace theology 
The countless theology is that some people are predestined to heaven, some are predestined to hell. I mentioned that this morning in the, this morning's message, and that some people can be saved, some people cannot be saved. Limited atonement. In other words, when Jesus died on the cross, he shed his blood. He didn't shed his blood for everybody. He only shed his blood for the elect. Okay, that's heresy. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You don't become a Calvinist by studying your Bible. You become a Calvinist by studying Calvinists. You become a Calvinist by studying Calvinists' interpretation of the Bible. You give a, five, you give a fifth grader, you give a second grader a King James Bible, and they will not be a Calvinist. Because the world means the world, and all means the, all, and the will means will, and, and whosoever will means whosoever will. You have to have somebody that thinks they're smarter than you to tell you that's not what it means for you to ever buy into that. And here at Calvary Baptist Church, we do not embrace the heresies of Calvinism. All right, if I thought that people were predestinated to go to hell and there was nothing I could do about it, we would not be having Operation Saturation. I will not be going up and down the streets and knocking on doors and passing out gospel tracts and inviting people to church and inviting people to come to Christ if I thought that there was nothing they could do to change their eternal destiny. Right. We would not send missionaries all over the world. We would not support 95 mission projects. We wouldn't run buses. Right. We wouldn't have altar calls and invitations and have personal workers and track racks. We wouldn't have any of that if we believed in Calvinism. I just wanted to clear the air on that. Amen. But the, the sovereign grace, the phrase sovereign grace or the sovereignty, you start talking about sovereignty in a lot of camp meetings, the preachers get nervous. Yeah. They've hijacked that word and they've changed it and, and polluted it and we serve a sovereign God. Yeah. And that God has grace that he bestows. Yeah. Amen. Right. So the phrase sovereign grace has been hijacked. The phrase the grace of God is found 20 times. Just that one phrase, the grace of God, is found 20 times in your Bible. By the way, the word grace has been hijacked too. Amen. I'm a grace preacher. I've heard preachers say, I'm a grace preacher. Well, if you're a God-called preacher, you, you're going to be a grace preacher. But that's what they mean is, I don't preach tough, hard, straight, plain preaching. I just, I'm a grace preacher, you know. It's all about the grace of God, amen. In other words, it's a blank check. Do what you want to, and you get done, God will forgive you for it. That's what they mean. I'm a grace preacher. We're all about grace. We're all about loving people. Our church is just one big group hug. You come here, and we'll just hug you and love you and tell you about the love and grace of God. Well, we will. We will do that, absolutely, every service. But somewhere in there, we gotta talk about sin. Yeah. And we got to talk about hell. Right, yeah. We got to talk about the judgment and wrath of God to those that don't receive His love and grace. Right. Somewhere in there, you got to balance all that out. I'm a grace preacher. Amen. Well, they hijacked the word grace. By the way, that's nothing new. They did that in Paul's day. Yes, sir. In fact, in Jude, he wrote about this. He said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that we should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. What about that? They took the grace of God and turned it into lasciviousness and he described those men as ungodly. Yes, sir. Isn't that ironic? Grace is not a license to sin. That's right. That's right. Oh, preacher, we live in a day of grace. God is gracious and God is merciful and God is loving. You're exactly right on every one of those points. I agree with you. But grace is not a license to sin. Paul said in Romans 6, 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Can we just sin ever how we want to sin, live ever any way we want to live and just know that God's going to pour his grace out on us? No, that's not how it works. 
The grace of God does not permit a believer to do anything contrary to God. The grace of God does not permit a believer to do anything contrary to the word of God. And the grace of God does not permit a believer to do anything contrary to the spirit of God. Just wanted to let that soak in a little bit. We're talking about the grace of God, God's grace. Not only do we see a sovereign grace, but in this passage we see a saving grace. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. Well, I like that. Bringeth salvation. The grace of God brings salvation. Let me see if I can reword that. I'm not changing the Bible. Let me just throw it at you from another perspective. Grace offers salvation. Grace makes salvation available. But some people do not accept it. Some people do not receive it. In fact, some people spurn the grace of God, therefore making it of no avail. Can I give you a Bible for that? 2 Corinthians 5, at the end of the chapter, going into end of chapter 5 and into chapter 2, he says this, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though Christ did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. For he hath made him, talking about Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Chapter 6, verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. God can extend his grace to someone that grace can be that brings salvation has appeared to all men but all men does not receive it right right for some of you are looking at me kind of funny let me just keep going here hebrews 10 hebrews 10 verse 26 for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much more sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified and all holy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. He said, what do you think is going to happen to somebody that tramples the Son of God, the blood of Christ, the grace of God tramples it under their feet? For we know him that hath said, vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Thought you was preaching on grace, preacher. I am preaching on the grace of God, God's unmerited favor, God's goodness and his, and his grace being bestowed. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, but all men don't receive the grace of God. Many of them turn their heart away. They reject the grace of God, and in doing so, they reject the blood of Christ. They reject, reject the sacrifice on the de- of, of Christ on the cross. They reject the work of Calvary, and in doing so, they bring a about wrath and damnation unto themselves. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. See, that's the balance of the grace preaching that a lot of preachers don't want to preach about. Yes, God is bestowing his grace. His grace is bringing salvation. It's a saving grace. But if you don't accept it, there's nothing positive at all I can say at that point. I mean, you're, 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 you're rejecting the atonement for your sin at your own peril. Those people that insist on earning their way to heaven, working their way to heaven, basically what they're saying is, I don't want his payment for my sin, I wanna pay for it myself. I read this evening that one of the uh, the speakers that spoke at Morehouse College, spoke, spoke the invocation there, apparently a very wealthy person, paid the whole entire college class 2019 paid off all their student debt. Oh, man. That was, a, that, was a, that was an act of grace. They didn't, they didn't, he didn't owe them that. 
but he just did it out of the kindness of his heart. Wow. Could you, could you, do you think there's anybody in that graduating class when he made that announcement or the college made that announcement that said, no, 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 I incurred that debt. I, I, I made that decision to come to this college and I know I couldn't afford it and I had to borrow the money and that's my bill and no, I don't want him to pay my bill. I insist on making, paying back my own student loan. Do you think there's gonna be a single one of them do that? But do you know how many people every day find out that Jesus paid their sin debt at Calvary and they say, thank you, but no thank you, I'll pay for it myself. I'll do good works, I'll go to church, I'll get baptized, I'll give money to missions, I'll do whatever, I'll take soup to the little shut-in, I'll be nice to my neighbor, and when I get to heaven, God will put all my good works on one side of the scale, put my bad works on the other side of the scale, and all my good works are gonna outweigh my bad works, and he'll just let me ride on into heaven. There's only one problem with that, that's not what the Bible teaches. It's not what the Bible teaches. And so the saving grace, the grace of God that bringeth salvation is has been extended, but not everybody receives it. I'm thankful that those of us that got saved, we can say we got saved by grace. Amen. Our family sings a song, I know how I made it. I made it by grace, amen. amen. Acts 15, 11, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. Ephesians 5, uh, 2, verse number 5, even when we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 2 Timothy 1, 9, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he has given us in Christ. That saving grace has been extended to every man, woman, boy, and girl. We believe that. But we also know that not every one of them will accept it. The point I'm trying to make is that not only was it a sovereign grace, it was a saving grace. In other words, the, the, the grace, we're about to get into that third, if I let me just give you that third point. It's not just a sovereign grace, it's not just a saving grace, but it is a schooling grace. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, look at the next verse, teaching us. I love that. I love that. The same grace that saved us will show us. The same grace that redeemed us will remind us. The same grace that was extended to us will exhort us in other words, the same grace that saved you will now sanctify you. And the same God that extended saving grace will now extend sanctifying grace. He didn't just save you from your sins. He didn't just save you from the penalty of your sins. He will now save you from a life of sin. In other words, God finishes what he started. God didn't just save you to keep you out of hell, he saved you for a reason. Look at what it says in verse number 10, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and ruling us, we should live soberly, righteously, and God in this present world. Look at verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can I tell you why many people are not looking for Jesus to come back? Because they're not living right. right. Amen. Amen. When you're living right, you are anticipating Jesus' return. When you're living according to his word and his will, you can't wait to see him. I know I've used this illustration before, but think back when you were a kid and your parents would leave you a list of chores and say, I'm gonna go to town, I'm gonna run some errands, this is what I want you to do. When I get back, this better be done. And you got to fooling around and you didn't do the things that were on the list. You didn't want them to come home. Right. You didn't want to hear that car pull up in the driveway. But now if you had done everything on that list and you'd gone down through there and checked all those things off, you couldn't wait till they got home because you wanted them to see that you did what you're supposed to do. You were looking for them. You were glad when they came home. You ran to meet them at the door with a hug and say, I did all my chores. But a lot of people are not looking for Jesus' return because they're just, quite frankly, not doing what he said do. Amen. And so we see that this grace that you and I have been introduced to that saved us, as I mentioned this morning, it saved me and 
1976. Some of you have been saved just in the last few days or weeks or months. I got saved as a little boy. Faith Baptist Church in Tifton, Georgia. I could take you to the spot. I could take you within about three feet of where I got saved. I was introduced to the grace of God. The sovereign grace, the grace of God, God's grace was extended to me and it saved me. But guess what? Ever since 1976, that same grace has been schooling me. Right. Amen. Several ways God's grace will school you and I. He will school us, teach us what we need to know through prayer. Say, preacher, do you, are, are, you, are, you, are you real? Well, Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I need all the grace I can get. Amen. Amen. And we get grace when we pray. Yeah. Amen. Is everybody okay? Yes, sir. Have you talked to the Father today? <laughs> so Dr. Beckham would say, pull his glasses down, look over his nose. Have you talked to the Father today? How much time did you spend yeah. last week praying? Because I'm going to tell you what happens to me when I pray. The grace of God that comes to me in my time of need begins to reveal the things in my life that I need to fix. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I just, just out of curiosity, show of hands, does that happen to anybody else beside me? When you're praying, the Holy Spirit brings things to your remembrance. And you go into the altar to pray, and you go to the throne of grace that you might find mercy and grace to help in time of need. And you go with needs, and you get grace. And when you're getting grace, then God starts showing you things and teaching you. What better place to get a good education than at the throne of grace? What a good place to not have to worry about false doctrine on, yeah. and false teaching Amen. is when you get in a one-on-one -on -one audience with, yeah. the, with the, the truth. Amen. <laughs> Capitalized truth. And you're talking to him because whatever he says to you, it's going to be true. He's going to bring back to your remembrance. That's what he said in the book of John. He's going to bring all things back to your remembrance whatsoever you've heard. You're sitting in church and you weren't really paying attention, but it was going in and you're, it kind of it kind of got lodged there in your in your head, and then you're praying or you're you're living the Christian life, and the Holy Spirit will bring back those things. Prayer is a powerful tool of God to teach you how to live a godly life. Which I think is maybe why some people don't pray. Because they're not, not up for another lesson in godliness. Amen. Amen. It's very convicting when you're praying. The Holy Spirit's saying, okay, now that I've got you, let's work on this. Let's fix this. Let's, let's work on that tone of voice. Let's work on that temper. Let's work on those lustful thoughts. Let's work on those covetous eyes. Let's, let's work on that gossiping tongue. Let's work on that greed. Let's, let's, let's work on that robbing God business. Let's, let's work on that loving people. Let's, while I got you, let me teach you some things about the godly life. It's a schooling grace through prayer. It's a schooling grace through his word. Acts 20, 32, and now brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. And then we're going to get more in depth into the word of God being used by God to help us live the Christian life. Let me just give you one verse just from memory. just came to my mind. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Sanctify them. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Sanctify, cleanse, purify, set apart. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is true. That was one of the memory verses in, this, in the Bible Institute last year. 
I had, had everybody memorize that verse because, see, if you and I want to be living a godly life, we have to be under a steady stream of the Word of God. I don't need a shower. I smell all right. I smell all right. I'll just turn my shirt inside out. I'll be fine. No, go take a shower. I'll just spray some Febreze on. I'll be fine. I put on some cologne. You can't cover up body odor with Chanel number no. five. There ain't enough Adidas. There ain't enough. Oh, there ain't enough of that Old Spice to cover up you needing a bath. Right. Yeah. Amen. And you know what prayer and Bible reading does for a Christian? Come on. It's a shower. Amen. Helps you live the godly life. Amen. I got some outlines up here for sale. If anybody wants to buy them, they've already been preached, but I'll sell them. Amen. <laughs> Through prayer, through the word of God. One more, let me give you one more. Schooling grace, he schools us, he teaches us the godly life through preaching. Yes, sir. Through preaching. I want to say this, I'm a product of the preaching that I've heard down Amen. through my Amen. life. Yes, the way I look at things, the way I interpret things, the way I interpret the world, world events, the way I interpret uh, the ministry, church philosophy, the way, the way I parent my children, the way I love on my wife and the relationship that I have on my, with my wife, the relationship that I have with God, the relationship that I have with other people, all that was shaped and molded, Brother Roth, through the preaching of the Word of God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'd come to church, sit down with a Bible in my lap, and say, tell me what I need to do to live the godly life. And men of God down through the years would get up, pin their ears yeah. back without fear or favor, and they would preach yeah. to me the word of God, and I would get a steady diet of how to live the godly life through the preaching of the word of God. I tell you, it's a good sign when you like preaching. It's a, it's a bad sign when you don't like preaching. Amen. Now, if it's, if it's Bible preaching, I like it. They can stand still with a block of ice in both hands. If it's Bible preaching, I'm in. Or they can run around like a Comanche Indian. If, if it's Bible preaching, I'm in. I don't care what the style is. As long as it's Bible, I'm in. But you've got some people who just don't like preaching. They like teaching. They don't like preaching. That's one of the signs of the end times. That's one of the signs of the last days. They cannot endure sound doctrine, but they will heap themselves teachers having itching ears. What are some things that you can teach and there's some things you just got to preach. Amen. Man, Amen. Some things have to be preached. And the godly life is one of them. Look at what he says in verse number, look at what he says in chapter 2, verse 1. I'm still in Titus. He's talking to a young preacher. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. He closes out the chapter, verse 15. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. What's he talking about? He's talking about godly living. Right. He's talking to a young preacher. He says, get up and pin your ears back and open the scriptures and tell people how to live the godly life and don't hold back. Right. Amen. That, by the way, is the grace of God being extended when God's been gracious enough to allow you to hear preaching. Do you know how many people live their whole life and never hear solid Bible preaching? Do you know what the population of the world is that doesn't get to hear Bible preaching? Those of us that have had that access to that, that have been introduced to that, that's the grace of God. Paul said in Galatians 1, verse 15, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen and immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. He was called by the grace of God to preach. Right. Amen. It was the grace of God that called Paul to preach. Yeah. Are y'all following this line it was the grace of God that called me to preach. Right. Not that I deserved it or that I was worthy of it. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 7 and 8. Paul said, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. 
Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul said, I'm a preacher because of the grace of God and I'm the least, I'm the most undeserving, but God, by his grace, called me to preach so that I could tell other people the gospel and how to live the Christian life. My point is this tonight. Before we get into this series on godly living, we need to understand that the grace of God that saved you and saved me is also teaching us. We're going to get into that next week. Tonight was the introduction. Next week is going to be the indoctrination. There is a major indoctrination process. You don't, you say, I don't like that word indoctrination. Well, Hollywood does it. You better believe they do it. All you got to do is just watch a movie and they're cramming same-sex marriage down everybody's throat, cramming fornication and adultery and, and lasciviousness and drunkenness and revelings and wickedness and ungodliness. They're cramming it down everybody's throat. Evolution. You can't hardly watch a documentary that doesn't have millions and millions of years ago. Indoctrination. But see, the Holy Spirit of God and the grace of God is indoctrinating or attempting to. Am I still in the book? Right. Teaching us? Teaching us? I like the word brainwash. We need our brains watched. Yes, Romans 12. Yes. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right. Right. Yeah. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Right. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Boy, I like that. Yeah. Renewing of your mind. I like that brainwashing. Yeah. So the Holy Spirit of God, the grace of God is going to be teaching and schooling you and I how to live the godly life. I'm glad he didn't stop with salvation. He didn't just bring salvation, but now he's bringing everything else. Are you ready for this? Peter said that pertains to life and godliness. What about that? He hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Well, this is going to be a fun series. And I'm asking God as a result of this to help me live a more godly life. Amen. A godly life. Psalm 1 talks about the ungodly. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. There's a contrast throughout the entire book of Psalms between the godly and the ungodly. And trust me when I say this, you don't want to be on the ungodly side. You don't even want to be hobnobbing with that crowd. In fact, the whole book of Psalms starts out with, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight's in the law of the Lord. Right. And his law doth he meditate. The whole book starts out with, don't even hang out with that crowd. Amen. Oh, but they're friends of mine, preacher. They're going to pull you down. You're going to have a hard time living a godly right. life. If all the people you ever hang around is ungodly people. That's you're going to have a hard time having a godly thought pattern if all you watch is ungodly movies and television. You're going to have a hard time having a, a godly walk with God when you're listening to ungodly lyrics and this ungodly filthy music they're playing today, pumping out. Pull up at the red light, they got their windows down, they're pumping music, it's got filthy language. I can't hardly stand it. I almost ran a red light last week. The guy beside me had his windows down playing that old filthy Filthy rap music with all those bad words. Just, I'm like, good night. Sitting here in my truck, minding my own business. You can't live a godly life and listen to that mess. Ah, right. oh, preacher, you're just being, you're being difficult. No, the grace of God that saved you is now teaching us to live the godly life. The question is, are we listening? Right. Are we learning what he's teaching us? Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you, Lord, tonight for the reminder from your word that you've called us to be a peculiar people, zealous 